Alex. Dawn. Alex. Alex. Dawn. Uh, you know Faraz. Are we, uh, do we have extra books? Extra books? Because I think... Raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your books. One, everyone else have a book? Amanda, you have a book. Roger, have a book. One, two, three, four books. I don't think we have four, but I will, I'll get what we have. Alright, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, as most of you heard, my name is Alex uh, Lahos. I, uh, been studying with Sheikh Shadi for a while, and uh, I'm going to be filling in every once in a while. Um, tonight's going to be my first time, so it's kind of like when you go to uh, to a play on Broadway and the uh, the real actor's not there, and you get to stand. So that's me. So, uh, but inshallah, it'll be a good show anyway. Um, while we're waiting for the books, uh, we're just going to do a quick review. So so far, we've covered the first uh, five chapters, I believe, right? Um, up through the prayer times. Um, for those of you who don't have the books, I'll just outline it quickly. Um, we started out with the first chapter, which we're going to look at a little bit again. Um, and it's really uh, just a, a brief uh, summation of why the prayer is so important, why it's the central feature of uh, our religion, the real importance of it. Sorry, sure. Um, yeah, that thing is loud. Um, so uh, while we're waiting from the books, uh, the first thing we're going to do once we get the books is we're just going to look a little bit at chapter one again and discuss some of the points that Sheikh Shadi made about it um, regarding the importance of the prayer and its centrality, why it's the most critical element of the deen as the subchapter, the subheading of the chapter says. Um, what we also covered uh, is who the prayer is obligatory upon and when, um, and that's very brief. It's uh, it's children, once they reach the age of seven, they should be encouraged to pray. And once they, each, they reach the age of 10, you should kind of really enforce the prayer on them. Even though it's not obligatory on them yet, you should really enforce it so that it becomes habitual. It's something that they're habituated to, they're used to. And when they do become mature, which is the age of puberty, they'll already be accustomed to it and it won't be like a big transition for them. Um, And so when it actually does become obligatory is at the age of puberty. Whenever the person hits puberty, there's no set age, obviously. Um, for boys, it's uh, when they have their first uh, nocturnal emission or when they start to have uh, grow hair other than, you know, the normal hair on their face and their head. Um, and for girls, it's when they have their first menstrual period. Um, so that's when the prayer becomes obligatory. Uh, there's the conditions of the prayer. So just going over that again, it's um, the time of the prayer should be in. So each prayer has its set time. And Sheikh Shadi also made a good chart for us showing the different prayer times. He's going to distribute that. So he's making copies now. Um, so again, the four preconditions of the prayer are the time, that the time for the prayer is in. Each prayer has its own time. Um, and we're going to deal a little bit more with that uh, right before we get into today's chapter. Um, also purification of yourself and your clothes. Um, your body and your clothes have to be free of the things that make them impure. Um, just briefly, that includes, you know, whatever exits through the front or the back, um, blood, uh, vomit. Any of those things on your clothes or on your body need to be washed off before you can pray. Um, also, the place needs to be pure, also free of all of those things. Um, and you need to have the direction of the prayer established. 
So um, from where we are, it's northeast. So you need to make the best effort to establish that direction, figure out where it is, and pray. So those are the four conditions that need to be met before you can pray. Um, in terms of the times of the prayer, and everybody has a book now, right? Okay, we're on page 14 for the prayer times. Sure. Um, I noticed that some Muslims will pray east, and even in our region. Is sure. Is considered incorrect, or if it is northeast just better? Well, so two things about that. First, there's a, there's a difference of opinion on it, um, and it has to do not with uh, religious texts or a different hadith or a different ayah in the Quran, but it's actually uh, due to people's understanding of how the geography works. So some people will say, well, if you look at a globe, yeah, it's northeast is the shortest way to go. But if you're looking at it on a flat map, some people will say, no, it should actually be kind of south, east, southeast. So it's, it's actually like a technical geographical difference. Um, and it has nothing to do with religious matters. Everybody still prays to Mecca. And it's just a, a, a kind of a mathematical difference on how to, how to reach that. Um, but the standard opinion is northeast. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done on it. But the other important thing to know is that um, you have some leeway in uh, attaining the proper direction. So if, uh, in, in this message, we're praying this way, right? So that's the Qibla, that's northeast. Um, 45 degrees in either direction, you're still within it. So even if you were off, which you would be, so if, you're, if it's northeast and you're praying east, you're still within that, so there's no need to repeat the prayer, um, even if done intentionally, at least in the opinion of Imam Malik. Even if you intentionally pray in the wrong direction, maybe because you're in a constrained hallway or something, you're still okay. So if you see somebody praying that way, it's not worth getting into a discussion with them about it, usually. Okay, so on page 14, um, let's see how much there is here. It's just quick pages. Um, Who would like to uh, do the reading? Somebody with a strong voice? I think we read, actually. We did this. Right. We have some new people, and we wanted to just uh, go over it quickly, and then we're going to... Chapter 5, we're not going to go that... Uh, oh yeah, this is chapter 5. Alright, actually, you know what I'll do? I'll just go through the points. So, there's five daily prayers. That's easier. Good, I don't have to yell anymore. Okay, so there are, there are five daily prayers. Uh, the first one, uh, it's called Fajr. And it starts um, at the beginning of dawn. And it goes until sunrise. Um, and again, Shane Shadi is printing on a chart which is going to help detail all of this and give us a nice visual for it. Um, the, uh, the next prayer, even though it's listed here, it's not one of the obligatory prayers, it's Doha. It's one of the uh, more stressed Sunnah prayers. So um, there's a description of it that, uh, from, from the Prophet wasallam that said that the Doha prayer is the prayer of the sincere people. Right, and of those who are really seeking the benefit. So that ha that's any time after sunrise and before the, uh, the, the first uh, noon prayer. That prayer is Zuhr. Zuhr is prayed um, from, and the chart is really going to be helpful for this, from basically what's true noon, when the sun is at its zenith, or slightly past it, until uh, late afternoon. That next prayer is Asr, and that's prayed from late, late afternoon until sunset. Although... Each prayer has its own time, and the time is uh, kind of expansive, right? So you have between almost each prayer to pray. Salat al is really emphasized to be prayed at the beginning. It should never be delayed. Um, it's preferable not to delay it at all, unlike the other prayers in which you really have an option to pray it either at the beginning or the end. The next prayer is Maghrib, there's a sunset prayer. There's no option there. That has to be prayed as soon as possible. So as soon as the sun sets, you call the Adhan, the Akama is called, and you pray. Um, and there's no difference of opinion on that. And then Isha is prayed f um, from the uh, right after the evening time until about the middle of the night you have to pray that. Although if it's delayed even until Fajr, it's uh, acceptable, but not preferable. So that's just briefly on the prayer times. And uh, so now we're up to chapter 6, which is the Adhan and the Aqama. And now we do need a reader. So uh, any volunteers? Anyone? Perfect. Oh, here we go. So here, I'll pass you the mic. Here you go. Bismillah. The word of God literally means two ears for that which is heard. 
It is, public, it is a public call to prayer. It is an obligation upon the community, it's far, such that if nobody does it, blame falls on the entire community. But as soon as one person does it, the duty is lifted from them. Its caller is called uh, Muatan. The Muatan has a great reward on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet said the callers to prayer will come with a beautiful long neck on the kiyama. This person also receives the honor of his saying, who is better in speech than one calls to Allah, does good, and says, I am one of the Muslims. Okay, so uh, two points. The, uh, the type of fard that it is, it's fard kifaya, right? So there's two types of fard. Um, fard kifaya is an obligation that is communal, as it states here. Meaning, as it's explained, if any one person in the community establishes it, then it's fulfilled and it counts for everyone in the community. That includes like building a mosque is a fard kifaya. Um, going on jihad, if, if you're in a Muslim nation, it's being attacked, it's fard kifaya. A group of the Muslims, or at least one of them, has to engage in it, and it suffices for it. Then there are other, uh, the other type of fard is fard ayn. Uh, the translation, transliteration of that would be A-Y-N. Fard ayn is something that's obligatory on each and every individual. So the fact that the community is doing it, or that some members of the community are doing it, is not sufficient to excuse you from doing it. It doesn't cover you. It's what every Muslim has to do. So like prayer and fasting, all of these are personal, individual obligations. So the, the calling of the Adhan is a Fard Kifaya. As long as somebody in the community has established it, then it suffices to relieve, of all, relieve us all of that duty. Um, there are some other uh, hadith regarding the reward of the person who calls the Adhan, the Mu'adhan. Um, in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed, it's even related that the Prophet Sallallahu said, if people knew the reward of calling the Adhan, then they would have used swords among them meaning they would have fought each other, even with swords, to be the one who calls the prayer. It's a bit of hyperbole, obviously, but just to emphasize the importance of, the prayer, of calling the Adhan and how much the reward is for it. I'm sorry, please go ahead. There are two names associated with the Adhan. The Ansari Abdullah um, Zaid and the Meccan Abu Madhura, who became Muslim after the conquest. When the Muslims were considering how to gather the people for prayer and various suggestions were made, including banging sticks and blowing a horn, the answer was given to Abdullah bin Zaid in a dream, <clears throat> in which an angel taught him the Adan, cons consisting of four takbirs and no taji, to explain shortly. After the conquest of Mecca, Abu Mudera was one of those who hated Islam, but submitted out of fear. The Prophet, may peace be upon him, saw him laughing at the Muaddin of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And so he called him over. Abu Muhairah said, when the Prophet, may peace be upon him, called me over to him, there was no man on the face of the earth I hated more than him. He placed his hand on my heart and I felt a coolness. My hatred was gone. Then he gave me a sack of coins and at that point, nobody on the face of the earth was more beloved to me than him. I asked him to appoint me as the Muaddin in Mecca, and he did, teaching me the Adan and the Akama. Okay, so um, a couple of points here. So uh, at the time when the Muslims were in Medina already, um, they, had, uh, they had a big enough group of people, they were the whole city, where the practice that they used to have in Mecca where they would just, somebody would just say, uh, uh, a salah, right, the prayer, and people would know that it was time to pray and come, that wasn't sufficient. They needed something to really like gather the people from throughout the city. Um, and so that's when the Prophet wasallam asked for these suggestions. Um, this is something that he did throughout his prophethood wasallam. Sometimes when, there, when nothing was revealed from Allah directly about it, he would uh, consult the Sahaba, his companions, and ask them um, what their opinion was. Um, and if somebody offered something that was, that was good, he would take it. Um, so consult is, this gives us the basis for consultation even by someone who has absolute authority over us. Um, so what he did is he asked and uh, Abdullah ibn Zaid said that he had a dream in which a man dressed in green came and taught him the words of the Adhan. And so then he came to the Prophet the next day Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and told him this and the Prophet said that's good and it's acceptable and that's what we'll use. Um, and then the companion Omar came to the Prophet and said, I had the same dream last night with those same words. 
So it was clear that this was guidance from Allah and that this is the way that Allah wanted the call to prayer to be. So this is where this was established. Um, regarding the situation with Abu Mahdura, um, there were people after the, the Muslims became strong in Mecca, which we covered in the, uh, in the Sira class, um, that even though they weren't being forced and nobody was forced to convert, they still felt some kind of fear and felt like maybe they should just join along just to go along so that they wouldn't be ostracized or fearing that maybe some retribution would come later on. And he was one of those people. And the Prophet knew this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so he went to him and he engaged him this way, changed his heart. Um, and on top of that, when the man asked for a great honor, as we've established that calling the Adhan is a big honor, um, the Prophet gave it to him. Um, just as a way of showing that he was willing to reconcile even with people who were strongly opposed to, to the religion before that. Um, prior to, to this in Mecca, prior to Abu uh, Mahdura becoming the Muaddin, Bilal, the companion Bilal, who was uh, Abyssinian and had been with the Prophet since the very beginning, وسلم, he was the one who was appointed to call the Adhan in Medina, um, mainly because of his righteousness and also because he had a really strong and beautiful voice so that he could be heard throughout the city and the Adhan sounded beautiful, which is why when you hear the Adhan being called now, there's a uh, melodiousness to it. Um, this is because of the son of Bilal, who, uh, who had that kind of voice and recited the, the Adhan in that way. Please go on. The Adhan consisted only two takbirs in the beginning and ta is it Taji? Taji. Taji. The Taji is to say the Shahada twice as normal, then repeat them in a louder voice. So there's a chart on the next, next page where we'll, we'll see it and we don't have to read through it. But so the original, the original way the Adhan was called is the way that we hear it now. This is the Medina Adhan, which is Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, etc. Right? So it's twice each one, four times Allahu Akbar, then twice each phrase. Um, the Adhan in Mecca was Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, just twice, then. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah and then in a louder voice repeat both of them twice so this was a difference in the way that the adhan was uh, recited in Mecca um, so and the chart is here it's helpful so you can review it on your own time just so when you hear the adhan you know exactly how the words are being said and what's being said as the Adan is being called, repeat everything the caller says. However, after Haya Allah Salah Haya and Haya Allah Bala say, La ha Allah Walla Kuwata Illa Bila, there's no power or strength except with Allah. When he is done completely supplicating. So before we get into the, the, the dua that's said after the Adan, so when you're hearing the Adan called, whether it's in your home or whether you're at the masjid, so every time the Mu'adhan says Allahu Akbar, you repeat in a low voice to yourself Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. For each phrase, you repeat the phrase exactly, except for those phrases in the center. Haya al salah and Haya al falah you just say La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, which is there's no power or strength except with Allah. Um, and this is the sunnah to do that um, when the Adhan is being called. And can you read the dua? I think you'll give it more justice. Sure. Um, do we have any volunteers who want to? Actually, let's let's get let's get the brothers. In. You have a book right next to you. Yeah, I'll pass. Just have a chair for reading. Yeah, you're my ne you're my next reader. Move up. Thanks.